On July 24, 1969, a date in human history largely forgotten, men from the moon first landed on planet Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The second equally critical portion of John F. Kennedy's 1961 challenge had been realized. The Apollo 11 crew, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, had flown a near-perfect first mission to the moon. It would be a tough act to follow. These three astronauts were waiting to try. Charles Pete Conrad, Alan Bean, and Dick Gordon. Thirty years later, the second crew to land on the moon got together to remember an electrifying launch, a pinpoint landing, and friendships forged in flight. Here are their memories of that intrepid voyage. Roger, copy. Central to any NASA mission was the flight director. Gerald Griffin, a former Air Force pilot, had the responsibility of shepherding Apollo 12's trip to the moon. Mercury had just finished uh, when I came to, to work for NASA. And we had uh, uh, already had the challenge to go to the moon. And if you really think about it, Gemini and Apollo were really kind of the same program. So was Mercury. It was all leading toward a lunar landing. Training for the lunar trip was extensive and repetitive. Numerous flights on the aptly named Vomit Comet, a converted Boeing 707 which simulated weightlessness, gave the crew an opportunity to practice mission activities in near zero gravity. After months of training and countless simulations, launch time was finally at hand. On November 14, 1969, the crew of Apollo 12 sat atop the massive Saturn V, waiting for a go from the controllers. One star, six. A few seconds after launch, uh, 30, 40 seconds after launch, something happened. 40 seconds. Mark 1 Bravo. This room, every light in here on these consoles, uh, went bright. Uh, there was red lights. Pete started talking to us that he saw all kinds of lights in the cockpit, uh, warning lights. Fuel cell lights and AC bus light, a fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. So I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm not sure we can get hit by lightning. We had 11 electrical warning lights associated with the electrical panel and in all our simulations and double never failures heard. and triple failures, they never figured out how to light all 11 with them one time, <laughs> but, but they were all on. Later on, Al asked me, why didn't I help him? I yeah. didn't help. <laughs> he wasn't I didn't help as polite as he <laughs> said it right now. <laughs> I, I, said, I didn't you help Al because I didn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> we learned a lot uh, that day on Apollo 12. We became the longest lightning rod in history. So it was time to let Conrad and company know that the translunar injection burn had been authorized and they were heading to the moon. Apollo 12, Houston, the good word is your go for TLI. Hope you do, we're ready. His comments during the landing were, were Pete Conrad personified. And boy, we're coming, we're coming right down with this baby, right down the middle. And Pete, six, you know, four. Hey, there it is. And then his comment when he stepped off on the moon, it was, it was very similar, you know, where Neil had been very historical and uh, Pete was very funny.
I was the smallest guy in the office, and I said nobody remembers what a second person said anyhow. <laughs> and so, they let alone who they are or anything. And so I said, well, we'll just, I'll say it may have been a big one, a little one for Neil, but it was a big one for a small fella like me, and I think I let that small fella. It wasn't long before Pete Conrad, now outside the lamb, could see they had realized a prime goal of the mission. As time for leaving the moon drew near, Alan Bean began to be concerned the lone booster rocket beneath them might not operate when called upon. <laughs> I wasn't calm, and I was. Pete looks yeah, over to me and says, yeah, "I hadn't been saying anything for a while." And Pete looks over and says. Is there anything worrying you or something? And I said, yeah, I'm kind of worried if they put this all together, you know I mean? We're not going to be here. And then you, in order to calm my nerves, you say, what? I said, don't worry about it. If it doesn't light, we'll become the first permanent monument <laughs> to the U.S. space program on the moon. That made me feel good. <laughs> Three, two, one, let's go. And away we go. Did it fire? Die? Now the only thing you got left is re-entry. Re uh -huh. right. It took about six minutes to enter. Dude. Dick was flying eight, in. Eight, eight, eight minutes. Eight minutes. I feel blessed every day. Feel lucky every single day. I just just lucked out of all these people on Earth here. Here we are. <laughs> We've often been asked what we discovered when we went to the moon. And we seem to respond that we discovered the Earth. Well, along with what uh, Al had to say, I was lucky to fly four. Mm -hmm. Really? And uh, I think you guys said it pretty well. We're just lucky to be there. <laughs> We're lucky to be there. Ten days after this historic reunion, Pete Conrad was killed in a motorcycle accident near his home in California. He was 69. This program is dedicated to the memory of Charles P. Conrad. His love of flying and his fearless spirit combined to crystallize the image of the astronaut as a true American hero. He possessed a fierce loyalty to his crewmates, a deep love for his family, and an unmatched devotion to his country. He will always be remembered for his childlike joy in discovery on Earth and in the heavens. Dum -dum -dum.